How's it going, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls? Jeff Benjamin with 9to5Mac. Let's get down to it. Is the 2020 MacBook Pro worth it? Thanks for watching 9to5Mac. Be sure to thumbs up, click the subscribe button, and then enable notifications with the bell icon so you won't miss any upcoming videos. So how are you doing everybody? This is Jeff Benjamin with 9to5Mac. I have it in the building, the 2020 13 inch MacBook Pro. It's not a 14 inch Pro. Still the same size, 13.3 inch display. Unlike its bigger brother, the 15 inch MacBook Pro, which was upgraded to a 16 inch MacBook Pro, the size of this guy stays the same, at least for this year. But what I will say is that I think Apple has finally, after four years, perfected the 13 inch MacBook Pro. And we're gonna talk about that here in this video. So of course the unboxing, you get a getting started guide inside the design by Apple in California packet. You also get some regulatory information and warranty information, and you get these right here, the Apple stickers. Also included in the box is the 61 watt USB-C power adapter. So that's gonna recharge your 13 inch MacBook Pro at full speed. Of course, the little prongs pop out like that and stows away with ease. So like I said, this is a USB-C power adapter, so it has a USB-C port, and you have a USB-C cable inside the box as well. This is for charging only. Typical standard issue MacBook Pro gear inside this box, so nothing surprising there so far. All right, so let's go ahead and finish unwrapping the MacBook Pro, and now let's talk about specifications. Now here's the thing, if you're buying a MacBook Pro, you want to at least get the 1799 version. That's the version that includes the 10th generation Intel quad-core CPU. Cheaper configurations feature an Intel 8th generation CPU with older graphics. It's slower to stay away from it if at all possible. Now let's talk about design and build quality. It's your typical MacBook Pro design, which means it's excellent. You have the all aluminum unibody chassis. You have the exhaust fan on the bottom. You have the four rubber feet. You have two intake ports on both sides of the MacBook Pro. Gonna help with airflow. Then you have the two Thunderbolt 3 ports and a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack input and two more Thunderbolt 3 ports on the opposite side. That's a total of four Thunderbolt 3 ports. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But by and large, this MacBook Pro follows the same exact design scheme as all the other MacBooks in Apple's lineup. So let's go ahead and open it up and see what we have inside here. Now, of course, the biggest new feature to come to this MacBook Pro is the new Magic Keyboard. That is a long time in the making, but it's finally here. But first of all, let's talk about the trackpad because as bad as Apple's keyboards have been over the past few years, their, their trackpads have been downright amazing. And a lot of people wonder, besides the performance, what's the difference between a MacBook Air and a MacBook Pro? One of the differences is the trackpad. You can see slightly larger on the MacBook Pro, and that's just gonna give you more room to pull off all those gestures. Now, of course, this trackpad is also solid state, so it doesn't move, it doesn't use any sort of diving board mechanism or anything like that. So wherever you click on this trackpad, your click is going to register. Apple's trackpads continue to be the gold standard when it comes to laptops. But who am I kidding? Let's talk about the star of the show, the keyboard, because this has been four years in the making. Yes, indeed, the Magic Keyboard, after migrating to the 16-inch MacBook Pro, after coming to the 2020 MacBook Air, it is finally on the best-selling desktop computer that Apple makes. So this Magic Keyboard has all the characteristics that make it so much better than the butterfly keyboard it replaces. First and foremost, you got a lot of key travel there. And for me, that's the most important improvement that the Magic Keyboard brings to the table. Just being able to type and actually being able to feel the keys to press in a meaningful way where it feels like your, your fingers aren't crashing into the keyboard. And then you have the inverted T arrow keys, you have an escape key, which are both welcome features for touch typists. And the previous MacBook Pro was terrible in that regard. So you can see the butterfly keyboard here on the bottom, the new Magic Keyboard on top, hardly any sort of key travel on the butterfly keyboard uh, it just makes a huge difference when typing especially for a long period of time if you're doing long form content you're going to notice a difference immediately and as mentioned you have those inverted t arrow keys you have the physical escape key great for touch type is being able to identify those keys without looking at your keyboard and not only do you get those benefits but you also get the benefit of having a more reliable keyboard that's much less prone to problems that the butterfly keyboard was downright infamous for. Trust me when I say this, it is a night and day difference typing on this keyboard compared to the butterfly keyboard. 
One of the biggest differentiating factors between the MacBook Air and the MacBook Pro is the presence of the touch bar. Now the touch bar has been around since 2016's MacBook Pro refresh and it's still here. And it doesn't appear that it's going away anytime soon. So the touch bar is an actual touch screen on your keyboard that rests right where the function keys normally reside. And what's displayed here will dynamically change based on the application that you're using. So here I'm using Final Cut Pro 10. Well, I can actually scrub the timeline right here from the touch bar. You can see my playhead, the little red line. Look at that. So you can see how this could be handy for new Mac users, those unfamiliar with keyboard shortcuts. For everyone else though, it's going to actually slow you down because you actually have to look down at the keyboard to see what's on the touch bar. As an advanced Mac user, I just don't find it all that useful. I prefer to have the physical function keys like you see here on the MacBook Air. The touch bar isn't horrible, but I just, I just don't find it all that useful and I feel it slows me down. But what is useful is the presence of four Thunderbolt 3 ports on the 1799 MacBook Pro and higher editions. It's another reason why I highly recommend if you're going to get a MacBook Pro to go ahead and get that 1799 model because unlike the entry level Pro, it features the four Thunderbolt 3 ports. And I don't think the convenience of having those ports on both sides can be overstated. It's so convenient when you, for instance, you need to charge your machine and it's awkward to try to plug it into the left side of the MacBook Pro. Well, you don't have to, you can plug it on the right side. And that goes for all your favorite Thunderbolt 3 accessories as well. But the really cool thing is that these models get two Thunderbolt 3 buses shared between the four ports. And that's going to give you precious additional bandwidth for high performance accessories like PCIe SSDs. Now, one thing that hasn't really changed with the 2020 MacBook Pro is the display. You still get the 13.3 inch display 2560 by 1600 native resolution with 227 pixels per inch. So one of my beats with Apple's laptops have always been the default resolution versus the native resolution. The default scale resolution that they choose is not perfect 2X pixel doubled, which I mean, it's kind of a purity thing, but it's just not perfectly crisp like it could be if the default resolution was exactly scaled in half compared to the native resolution. But I know nitpicky, but that's why I appreciate displays like the Pro Display XDR because it is perfectly pixel doubled and it just looks glorious. But that's not to say that this MacBook Pro display is bad at all because that couldn't be further from the truth. It still looks amazing. Now, another difference between the MacBook Pro and the MacBook Air is that the MacBook Pro supports P3 wide color. So you're going to be able to see a wider range of colors on the MacBook Pro display panel when compared to the MacBook Air. And the MacBook Pro panel can also get brighter 500 nits versus 400 nits on the MacBook Air. But even in bright light, I didn't notice much of a difference between the two in real world usage. Now, while the sound quality is nowhere near the 16 inch I'm MacBook Pro, one port on the right side of the It's still able to pump plenty of sound through those speakers. Obviously, you know, physics, it's going to be limited by the small chassis, the small amount of displacement, but for a laptop this size with speakers of this size, it still sounds pretty good in my opinion. So the question that a lot of people are going to ask is number one, should I upgrade from the previous edition MacBook Pro? And number two, should I get this or should I get the MacBook Air? Well, let me just say this. If you're coming from an older MacBook Pro, the keyboard alone is worth the upgrade. It's going to make a huge difference in both productivity and reliability. But if you're trying to decide between a MacBook Pro and a MacBook Air, then you really have to look at how you plan on using the machine. If you're just doing basic computing tasks, you're browsing the web, checking email, basic stuff, then the MacBook Air is what you want to get. You especially want the MacBook Air if you're considering the low-end 1299 MacBook Pro. Just skip that one and go with the MacBook Air because like the higher-end 2020 MacBook Pro, the MacBook Air has a 10th generation Intel CPU inside, which is going to give you better performance compared to the 8th gen CPUs inside the entry-level MacBook Pro. Now, I ran some Geekbench tests. I also ran some Unigen Heaven tests as well. Now, admittedly, my tests aren't exactly apples to apples because I'm comparing the entry-level 2019 MacBook Pro to the higher-end mid-range 2020 MacBook Pro, and I'm also comparing the entry-level MacBook Air to the higher-end MacBook Pro. But nonetheless, it gives you a good ballpark idea of what to expect here. So obviously multi-core performance is going to be best on the 2020 MacBook Pro, the 1799 with the 
2 GHz quad-core CPU, and you see the Geekbench 5 Compute Benchmark for both Metal and OpenCL, and unsurprisingly the 2020 MacBook Pro 1799 edition best the other two machines. Now obviously a better test would be to compare the quad-core MacBook Air, unfortunately I only have the entry-level model, so just keep that in mind, like I said, not exactly apples to apples here. And here you can see the Unigen Valley benchmark on the 2020 MacBook Pro. This is a 1920 by 1080 ultra settings, two times anti-aliasing. Now, obviously the 2020 MacBook Pro had the best performance of the three, but one of the things that really stood out to me was the cooling. The 2020 MacBook Pro was noticeably quieter when under load when compared to the MacBook Air or the previous gen MacBook Pro. Now another benefit is that you can directly connect a Pro Display XDR. The Intel Iris Plus graphics will allow you to connect to the Pro Display XDR as you can see here in System Profiler at full 6K resolution. Now obviously we're running in retina mode, pixel doubled, but you can see it's a perfect 2X retina there with that Pro Display XDR connected with a single Thunderbolt 3 cable at full 6K resolution running off this MacBook Pro. Now I will say the performance isn't what I would call great. I mean, it works. And for instance, if you're editing video and you go into full screen in Final Cut Pro 10, you notice a little bit of a delay, a little bit of a stutter, but things like web browsing, basic tasks are gonna work perfectly fine at 6K full resolution. Just obviously temper your expectations a bit because this is still an integrated GPU connecting to a very high-end display. Obviously, you'll have better performance with dedicated graphics. Now, these days, whenever I recommend a MacBook, I always say get at least 16 gigabytes of RAM. And the 1799 MacBook Pro with the Intel 10th generation GPU comes with 16 gigabytes of RAM by default. And this is a huge win for creative professionals that use apps regularly that require a lot of RAM to run their best, such as Final Cut Pro 10. So not only do you get more memory, but you get faster LPDDRX modules running at 3733 megahertz. And as noted in the MacBook Air review, these modules are specifically designed to be more power efficient, which is obviously great for laptops. With the 1799 configuration, you get 512 gigabytes of flash storage. And this storage is very fast, as you can see here from our Blackmagic disk speed test tool. Somewhere in the ballpark of 2000 megabytes per second write and read, more than fast enough for 4K high bitrate workflows. Now you can configure the MacBook Pro with up to four terabytes of flash storage, which is great if you're working with large media. And although I definitely don't recommend the entry-level MacBook Pro, the 1299 version, it's still nice to know that Apple has bumped up the default storage from 128 to 256 gigabytes. Now the FaceTime HD camera, basic run-of-the-mill 720p camera, nothing too exciting here, still requires a ton of light to make it look somewhat decent. Uh, still running at 720p, no 1080p here at all. For as good as Apple's iPhone cameras are, man, I have to say the Mac continues just to get the short end of the stick with regard to camera quality. The FaceTime HD camera just doesn't look all that good. And like I said, it requires a ton of light to even be passable. Hopefully that will be addressed in future iterations of the MacBook Pro. I have to be honest, for as good as the MacBook Pro is, I mean, obviously the keyboard is a major improvement and obviously the 10th gen CPUs are a big improvement as well. But it's just that the MacBook Air is already so good that I think most people are gonna be perfectly fine with that MacBook Air. Now, for those that know they need a machine of the MacBook Pro's caliber, like you know you need those four Thunderbolt 3 ports, then obviously you wanna go with the MacBook Pro because there's nothing that the Air can do to compete with the MacBook Pro on that level. Having four Thunderbolt 3 ports with two different buses is a game changer depending on how and what type of accessories you use with your MacBook Pro. And of course, if you just hate typing on your MacBook Pro, then it's another reason to consider upgrading either to the Air or to this 2020 MacBook Pro. If you want the best 13 inch laptop that Apple sells, this is it. But be honest with yourself about your workflow because not everyone needs the best of the best because depending on your needs, the MacBook Air may be good enough. What do you guys think about the matter? Let me know down below in the comments. This is Jeff with 9to5Mac.